Okay, so I think we can uh, start. So Vianova is happy to welcome everyone at this webinar. Today, with uh, the help of several uh, speakers, we will help you navigate the ambiguous and uh, chaotic world of mobility that they are sharing. So my name is uh, Thibaut Febvre, and I'm the CEO of uh, Vianova. And uh, I'm joined here with uh, several uh, other speakers. I'm Thibaut Gassan, I'm the CEO of uh, Vianova. I am Adrien Olas, I am a lawyer at the Paris Bar. I'm specialized in uh, IPIT with a strong focus on data protection and GDPR. And I'm the co-founder of uh, Jailbreak. My name is Yuan Reiche, and I'm specialized in data management system, uh, particularly with open data. Thank you. So to put uh, back some uh, context first, uh, in the past decade, we uh, have seen an explosion of uh, new transportation services, bringing cars to city streets. On the one hand, uh, we now have uh, 30,000 free floating vehicles in operation in Paris. On the other hand, 1.5 million packages are delivered every day in uh, New York City. So we now have a cumbersome traffic regulations in an overcrowded urban space. And in this inadequate environment, both cities and mobility, mobility operators are facing challenges. Cities are overwhelmed with new mobility solutions. And on the other hand, uh, mobility operators face inadequate regulation and public space. Today is uh, only a testing ground. Uh, which is determine, determining uh, how we will uh, approach, uh, notably um, autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think it's uh, it's good to keep in mind that um, the madness will only keep uh, growing uh, with uh, delivery robots, uh, drones, uh, flying taxis, uh, and of course uh, autonomous vehicles. So consequently. Uh, these uh, new mobility solutions need effective regulations and uh, new space uh, planning. So uh, here is uh, uh, today's uh, agenda. Uh, so first we will uh, uh, see what can cities uh, do with the right mobility uh, data. Then uh, we will uh, learn uh, how uh, the MDS uh, framework can bring a new municipalist energy to cities. Then uh, we will uh, showcase together uh, some best practices and uh, use cases uh, for MDS integration and data sharing. And uh, finally, uh, we will uh, see how uh, GDPR uh, comes into play. Thank you, Thibaut, for the first uh, introduction. Um, uh, maybe the micro is a bit far, but I hope everyone can hear us. Otherwise, uh, you can just shout or oh, not shout at you, just write it on the Q&A, uh, tell us that we, you can't hear us. Um, I'm going to start with uh, actually the following questions. Uh, what can cities do with the right mobility data? Which in other way means uh, why should city actually... Um, let me just see if everyone hear us here. Audio is good, perfect. Uh, yeah. go back. All right, let's go back. All right, sorry. Um, so I think the main question here is, is, is why cities should actually ask uh, data. Uh, and there's five main reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is actually crafting more informed policies based on data-driven insights. Um, so more and more vehicles will be connected. Um, cities knows needs to grasp uh, that technology evolutions and make sure that they can actually um, craft that policies based on these data-driven insights coming from these connected vehicles. Secondly, enforcing policies. Enforcing policies is, uh, and especially with new mobility, has become very inefficient for, uh, uh, for city authorities. Uh, today, again, uh, thanks to that data and uh, um, IoT devices uh, and connected vehicles that are actually uh, going on more and more in the city, uh, enforcing policies based on GPS location is more and more possible. Uh, these policies can be of several sorts that will go uh, together through uh, during the use cases. Um, and uh, city authorities can also measure uh, the progress towards city goals, to, to which extent introduction of 
certain mobility providers actually answer uh, the safety, sustainability, and equity goals uh, of, of that city. Uh, fourth, uh, support urban planning decisions. Uh, again, we will see that through the use case. Uh, one can actually look at uh, to which extent uh, some specific um, uh, vehicles, like uh, two wheels vehicles, use cycling lanes uh, and actually prioritize certain investments on infrastructure. And finally, uh, what one could actually call a monitor daily activity or actually orchestration mobility. Uh, let's say, as it happens a lot lately in France or in Paris, uh, strike. How do you actually do uh, to make sure that uh, other mobility providers basically replace uh, um, a non-functioning uh, public transport? To go to the next one. Yeah, so we actually argue at Genova, uh, and I believe we're not the only one, that uh, scooters are actually a great opportunity for cities uh, for three different reasons. Uh, uh, the first one is actually uh, it actually um, quicken the adoption of uh, micro-mobility, uh, two wheels uh, generally, and more sustainable mobility. Uh, it actually helps cities rethinking uh, the way they actually uh, allocate space uh, and prioritize space to the right mobility uh, services. But also, and, and, and most importantly, it can allow basically cities to start accessing data. Why accessing data? Uh, because cities uh, have, uh, uh, when an operator comes in the city and actually uses the public space, uh, most, in most jurisdictions in Europe, they need to ask for a permit. Uh, and that is of uh, big needs that uh, within that permit, uh, within, within that permit, uh, that uh, uh, basically that uh, data sharing requirements uh, is being asked. Uh, this to allow a fair distribution of public space to the prioritized uh, mobility services uh, within the public right of way. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about mobility data and uh, what does it look like in real life and, um, and then talk about how you can use it as a regulator, as a city to leverage this data uh, to actually control and keep in check what the operators do. So um, first off, when we talk about mobility data, uh, we talk about uh, mainly open data, and we will talk then later about what is not open, and that's the point of NDS, but first, uh, open data is, uh, is the law in France uh, when, you are, uh, when, you have, uh, when you are an authority and you uh, regulate data, you have to open it. And uh, it's also the name of the game. Uh, all operators have uh, open data feeds, and people can reuse it. So I'm going to show some examples. But first off, uh, this is an example. It's not about specialty, uh, specialty uh, mobility, but it's about uh, a data set that is published by the, the government about uh, you know, accidents. And uh, some people uh, use it to make a map and the point is that when you you are a data producer, you are a regulator, you cannot um, you cannot predict all the ways that this data will be used. So that's the point. Next. So in France, you have uh, the website transport.data.gov.fr. It's actually a national action access point, which is uh, the law in Europe since 2017. All um, member countries must have a national access point, an NAP, which is a website where all the uh, mobility data must be uh, accessible. And uh, the French one uh, is the, the best example. And uh, on this website, you can find all kinds of mobility data, JTFS, GVFS, not yet MDS because there is no city at the moment to publish MDS data, or not on this website at the least. But this is a good example to, to actually uh, download and uh, access uh, these kinds of data sets. And this, they are all in open data and they are an open license and people can uh, use it. This is a platform that a producer push the data and then data users, uh, application uh, developers can pull this data and actually produce good services, uh, applications that we use every day, like City Mapper, for example. And then in the end, end users, consumers that we are all citizens, have uh, the best, the best actually service at their disposal. Next, uh, this is another example for the um, uh, charging stations for EV, electric vehicles. It's also regulated. Uh, all the local governments who control uh, charging stations must must publish these uh, data sets, 
and they are also open and people can control the data. Okay, next. Uh, in real life, this is the, the web page for the, what do you say, the GTFS for a city, a random city, uh, which is Poitiers in this case. And you can actually see that the license is open. It means that you can use it, uh, access it, modify, and share it. This is the three criteria that must uh, exist to have this uh, open data. Next. Uh, this is the valid data set, which is actually GPFS. So GTFS, many people probably know about it. It's uh, 10 years old now. It's about transit data, many buses, uh, metro, stuff like that. GPFS uh, is uh, newer. It's, uh, I think, three or four years old. It's about uh, new kinds of mobilities, which like uh, free-floating, uh, bikes, stuff like that. And, uh, and Velib, the Velib uh, feed is published in uh, GPFS. And I'm going to show one example of what you can do with it. Uh, previous slide, please. So um, the GPFS uh, feed for Velib, which is open data, is published. And you have the, the official website, which uh, you can access this data. But there is no way to actually use it as a, as a citizen if you're not a uh, developer. So one guy, actually, uh, a few months uh, ago, created a website to actually uh, use this data and uh, show what you can do with it. And so you have this, uh, this graph. The, the blue line shows the official uh, numbers of uh, Belib bikes in circulation, meaning they are not used. They are, um, they are in the station, and they can be accessed. And the, the guy who made this website, who made this uh, presentation, uh, made an estimation of the VLIBs that are not actually usable because they are uh, broken. And it's uh, the, the green line, which is closer to the actual number of uh, usable valid bikes in Paris at the moment. And you can uh, actually see that in the last month or so, there is a, a very big uh, decrease of uh, usable bikes because they are actually uh, ridden. Uh, people are using, are using them. So that's why uh, you don't find uh, bikes in the station as easy as before because uh, of some factors like the, the strikes, for example. But... Uh, this is a good, in my opinion, it's a good example because you have the official data, which is the blue line. But what you can do as a regulator, you can actually control and uh, make use of this data to, to see the reality of the, the urban land, landscape, as it were. And I think as a, it is a point of what you can do with MDS. So MDS is, a, uh, let's say, a, a stage after GBFS. It's actually uh, other data, which is also private, and we'll get to this point later. But the point is, as a city, what can I ask to the, the operators to actually check what they do and, uh, and make sure that the people, the citizens of my city, have a good service, a good valid, a good uh, free-floating uh, uh, you know, uh, scooters, etc. And uh, yeah, the point is to actually demand something and to uh, leverage the data to regulate. And this is another example uh, from the same uh, API. And you can check the, the link. Uh, the, the link you can pick, you can click on the presentation. It will probably uh, will be shared later. All the link can be uh, accessible from the, the slides. Thank you. I think, I think there was just a question. I saw uh, in the chat, just to make sure that we uh, see that question. On the top right. Um, just check the question. What was that? Do you feel enough of it? Don't choose to be a first. That's a good point. Yeah, uh, it's not using the the. It's all. It's using the old uh, feed. Um, now, Veli Metropole is actually publishing in GBFS, but now, before, they didn't. But uh, it's probably the same uh, numbers. 
I would think that it's the same number of Belib, but the, the guy who made this uh, website, which I showed, uh, developed this website before the GPFS split was accessible. But uh, in the end, it's uh, I'm, the same. I'm sure we'll go through that in, in more details in the Q&A. Yeah. Um, and as you hear, the, the next next chapter is really looking at, at, at to which extent or how MDS can bring a new municipalist energy to cities. Uh, so by municipalist, we mean how actually cities can take back or take control, or take the rain back on uh, on streets. And actually, our streets are being used by the different mobility services. Um, so um, here is... is uh, um, here is is, um, is an advertising basically from uh, from Uber uh, that uh, uh, when uh, they actually showed that um, here uh, ride hailing that was the false promise could actually replace car ownership um, and actually to some extent uh, uh, remove congestion in cities um, and actually from from what we see uh, is that behind actually that false promise the reality was that there was an increase of 30 percent congestion in uh, New York City and San Francisco uh, and the research actually came uh, around 2019, which means that uh, the first uh, red headers uh, deployed their fleet in 2010, and it took nine years for the cities actually to realize that it increased by 30% the congestion. Um, so here it's a very good example to show that um, only that I can really like enable city officials to assess the quality of service, as you mentioned, of the mobility operators, of the mobility providers, and to which extent actually they answer the city objectives. Uh, whether it is on the safety or sustainability or equity objectives. Um, now I'm going to go a bit more into the technical um, part uh, about MDS and the MDS communication protocol. Um, so MDS uh, is a new innovative communication protocol that was published in 2018, uh, first by, um, uh, actually used by LADOT, which is a transport uh, agency of uh, Los Angeles. Uh, that uh, protocol basically uh, helps uh, cities and mobility operators exchanging data in a standardized way. Um, and it helps cities actually, um, as you mentioned before, um, enforce, uh, evaluate, and actually actively manage uh, uh, mobility operators on the public space. Uh, the MDS framework uh, is actually made of three APIs, which I will go through that uh, in the next slides. It is open source and collaborative. Everything can be checked online in terms of the data format. It is governed by a non-profit US-based organization called OMF. Um, and it's been uh, adhering to best practices of privacy standard, standards uh, from uh, day one. Uh, as I said, collaborative, so everyone can actually contribute to the open source code of MDS. Um, <clears throat> Go to the next slide. So um, I'm going to go through these three APIs uh, quite uh, quickly, and I will answer this Q&A uh, later if you have any questions on that. The provider API was the first API that was set up. Uh, that API basically allow um, uh, operators to send uh, data uh, to agencies or city authorities. These data are historical data. Uh, they are basically of two folds, uh, vehicle uh, status uh, and trips information. Uh, so one can actually uh, have information about the different trips routes, aggregated trips routes, uh, or origin and destination, so mobility, mobility flows in the city. But they can also check historically the level of availability uh, of the fleet being deployed. As you mentioned, what we actually see is that, uh, to some extent, 10 to 15% of the fleets that is being deployed in cities are actually out of order, uh, meaning they're not actually being used by, they, they are out of order, so they can't be used by citizens, to, to which extent they actually uh, polluting in a way the public are aware uh, because they're not providing them the right service. Um, <clears throat> if we go to uh, the next slide, so agency API. Uh, the agency API is the real-time feed, again, between operators and agency. Operators will basically send real-time information about the vehicle, but also telemetry data. Uh, telemetry data are GPS coordinates and speed. Uh, one of the main use cases of that API is actually regulation and enforcement. Uh, to make sure that uh, speed limits are being um, uh, basically uh, enforced to the different vehicles, but also different exclusion zones or parking zones, forbidden parking zones, are being respected by the operators themselves or by the users uh, within uh, the city space. Um, and the next one is actually probably the most exciting API, is the policy API 
which uh, in as it is today uh, allow agencies or city authorities actually to uh, send uh, to operators uh, regulation enforcement rules so uh, geospatial rules and regulations uh, about uh, uh, including basically a period of application a rule type which could be basically uh, speed limit which could be uh, parking which could be a defined number of of, of, um, of, uh, of vehicles per area um, and a geography, so the area itself, basically. Uh, and uh, this also allows, uh, in a standardized way, uh, every city authorities to send all these geospatial regulations uh, uh, to all the operators uh, so that they can actually respect uh, regulation in the public right of way. Um, so you may mention GBFS before. Um, I think it's very important that everyone get this clear. In, like, what is the difference between GBFS and MDS? GBFS is a little bit uh, older than MDS. It was actually published in November 15. Um, originally, it was created for bike share and, and actually docked bike share systems. Uh, this is um, uh, most actually used again for bike share. And the usability of the GBFS is for traveler information, uh, which means actually that uh, this uh, GBFS was actually built uh, in order uh, for services, consumer services, to show the availability of the mobility services. Whereas MDS, which is uh, a lot more precise and granular, uh, has been uh, developed actually for transport planning, regulation enforcement for government agencies. Um, uh, GBFS only for the bike sharing system, MDS for all devices in the mass, whether it is an e-scooter, whether it is dockless bikes, car sharing services, ride hailing services, delivery services, um, drones, everything normally uh, or hopefully uh, actually should be included in this MDS within the next 10 years. Um, uh, it is a bilateral exchange of information, whereas GBFS is only one way, only uh, information from the operators are being sent uh, to uh, other parties. Whereas for the MDS, it is a bilateral exchange of information between cities and operators. Um, so one of the big questions that we had at Ganova uh, with the cities that we are, we are, we are talking to and working um, is actually how cities should uh, come about by asking for the data uh, to mobility operators. So obviously there is the way that is the proactive way in kind of like asking kindly the operators to share the data. Uh, what we see is that for shared micromobility, it worked more or less. Uh, for some, it worked very well. For others, to some extent. Uh, for ride hailing, I haven't seen that it actually work in a proactive way. Um, so what actually we recommend is to include that data sharing requirements in the operator's permit, uh, making sure that within the operator's permit, so when the permit is being granted within that permit, uh, there's a legal uh, um, requirement for the data sharing from the operators to the city. And it's actually best to specify the data standard there, uh, because once it's actually being published, then it's very difficult somehow to renegotiate. Um, the municipality also need to define very clearly the purpose of the share of the mobility data, to which extent they're going to use uh, the data and communicate that to the operators. We argue that uh, those purposes need to be very transparent, but we also think that they should be broad enough so that they can actually uh, um, encompass a certain number of use cases, some that could not be defined basically at first, as, as everyone basically learned, and new use cases could actually uh, appear. Um, set and sign that standard license agreements, uh, which means that uh, cities basically should uh, have a license agreements for the sharing of the data with all the operators. Uh, this uh, license agreement should be the same across all the standard, all the operators. And it should integrate uh, a granular data requirement, story called in real time, and it should contain basically the vehicle ID for enforcement. Uh, both parties need to follow the guidelines uh, around GDPR regulations. Uh, and please let's avoid like signing ad hoc agreements, uh, making sure that basically every uh, agreement is uh, standardized uh, across all operators. Um, and then the question is then the last part, which is processing this. Uh, data, doing the API integration and processing the data, which could be done either by the city, uh, if they have the technical and legal and operative -like capacity, or through uh, a third-party platform like Yanova. Um, policy making. Um, so, policy making, what we see, and 
actually what we recommend is an iterative feedback loop. Uh, we believe actually it's very difficult for new mobility solutions to uh, get it right the first time. Uh, um, I don't think it's, it's, it's possible. So um, uh, we believe that the best way to go about it is actually uh, go from the city goals, uh, sustainability, safety, and uh, equity goals, and then establish the right set of policies that uh, match uh, with the mobility operators that are being introduced. In the city. Um, from that, uh, there is uh, uh, the real-time evaluation framework, which is around monitoring the operations and enforcing the policies. Um, this is basically done on a real-time basis. Uh, the data themselves basically produce insights. From these insights, uh, the city should evaluate the policies and am amend this policy uh, according to these insights. So that we have a feedback loop and we make sure that uh, we can basically iterate and on the policies themselves so that basically it can answer um, and match with the policies and thus the city goals that we've implemented, that we wish to implement. Um, so briefly, uh, where uh, what, what is the role of Vianova in all this? Uh, Vianova basically helps cities processing mobility data and keeping it, keeping it secure. Uh, we have, uh, so we receive basically data from mobility providers, uh, also uh, from open open data from cities and other data sets, uh, we process that data within the backend. Within the backend, uh, processing could be uh, aggregation, other analytical functions, or machine learning tourism to basically make sure that we pull out the right uh, insights. These insights are being published in two different ways: web dashboard and API suites. Um, API suite, why? Because we make we want to make sure that. Uh, cities can build upon our work and basically uh, build new tools among what we're actually uh, uh, building. Uh, and that data scientists, urban planners can easily basically retrieve the right information and make sure they can really get the right, do the right decisions based on that. Um, open data, uh, which basically is a decision of the city of what they want to actually publish in open data. Uh, certain op uh, MDS uh, data in an aggregated way aggregated way could, to some extent, be published in open data if it doesn't contain any sort of competitive or sensitive information. Alert notification, this is uh, something that we will uh, look at uh, in the use case uh, that I think will be a bit more. Sorry. Right. So I have uh, four or five use cases. Um, and uh, the first one is actually the live monitoring of active uh, vehicle fleets, uh, which has been enabled in uh, Brussels. Um, here you can see basically the set of the providers uh, from a city perspective. They can understand here that the density uh, and the services themselves are actually mostly located in the city center of Brussels or in the east part, which is called XL, uh, which generally is the, we see the most wealthy area um, here, uh, which also, you know, pose some questions, raise some questions about the equity of that services throughout the whole inhabitants of Brussels. Uh, you can also easily see here the number of devices that are uh, deployed in the city. And also, quite importantly, uh, if we take the example of Cirque, you can see uh, the availability of that fleet. means here that for that day, which is September 12, 2019, uh, less than 3% of the fleet was actually out of order, <coughs> which is a great quality of service. Next slide is... Um, one actually of the biggest question from cities is how to uh, handle the parking. Um, today's uh, obviously like in the last century, there has not been any decisions in the urban planning to host free floating vehicles because they were not existing. Um, another question is like as they're appearing in mass in cities, uh, what should we do about and how we should park them on the sidewalk? Not very possible because very tiny sidewalk in Europe. Where could we put them? And one of the decisions that we see that most cities are taking is actually replacing uh, on-street parking bays uh, with mobility hubs. That was a decision by Marseille and Paris. Um, and in this case, um, here, uh, there's different processes. Uh, the process is the following one. Uh, first, analyzing the parking patterns and the parking hotspots, then identifying the mobility hubs with the public space data, where these hubs should be located. Uh, geofencing these uh, areas and publishing that regulation to uh, the operators themselves and checking the compliance of the operators. <clears throat> um, another use case uh, for Brussels. Um, so 
uh, within the, the RIT of Bruxelles, which is the regulatory document uh, set by the, the, the Bruxelles Capital, <coughs> was set up actually uh, forbidden parking policies. Uh, that was mostly actually identified in areas with high pedestrian flows and narrow sidewalks uh, to avoid basically conflict between pedestrian <coughs> and uh, e-scooters. Uh, so we mapped actually these areas uh, in the city uh, and published that to operators and then checked the compliance uh, in real time of operators to uh, this uh, different uh, regulation. Um, checking compliance mean what? Uh, mean Basically, here you can see uh, that in real time, a city uh, can uh, report uh, a vehicle that uh, is on an unauthorized parking and send basically a notification directly uh, to the operator for vehicle removal. <coughs> um, last but not least, very important to look at uh, also different examples. Uh, it comes uh, that uh, MDS enable a lot of different uh, uh, and policy enforcement use case. Um, as you may know all, uh, we had a lot of uh, strikes in Paris lately and a lot of demonstrations, uh, which uh, then one of the things that could have been done was to exclude certain zones uh, from zones of deployments from the demonstrations because to some extent these features being used to uh, being thrown to different shops. Uh, so it's actually uh, a good way to do it. So dynamic regulations in case of different city events or, or, or regulations or, or demonstrations. Um, and uh, also important to note that uh, MDS, again, is not limited to share e scooters. And here I took the example of, um, uh, of two problems that I see in cities, uh, the delivery issue uh, and how basically a city can uh, dynamically, basically, geofence regulation uh, within the urban centers for the access of delivery vans, depending on, on the traffic or pollution level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but also, note that we have in Paris, um, uh, uh, urban, the urban centers is being closed in the weekends. Uh, we have a lot of demonstrations, a lot of road closure, uh, which basically Google Map and Waze do not capture. Uh, here, the biggest question is like, um, how do we actually make sure that the cities can or the police themselves can actually publish that information directly to uh, Waze and Google Maps. This is, could be possible then uh, with MDS by providing basically road closure information, enabling all these navigation systems to include in their routing uh, that road closure. Uh, urban planning. Uh, here for urban planning, uh, we can look at, uh, and here this is for the city of Brussels, uh, we looked at um, uh, the different trips intensity or the journey's intensity per uh, road section. Uh, so it enabled us basically uh, to understand whether or not uh, there was some potential risk um, of this new uh, new mobility uh, usage uh, in, in, in certain streets. So try to map the usage uh, of these new mobility services with the riskiness of the road, whether or not, for instance, there was a cycling pass. And that's it for me, sorry. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it is your turn. Yeah, yeah. So we'll jump to the most <coughs> exciting part, which is, as usual, the legal part. Um, and so we'll talk about GDPR. So I assume that you are, everyone here is <coughs> acquainted with the meaning and the general meaning of GDPR. Um, <coughs> but I'm quite happy that we talk uh, about GDPR today, not only because this is one of my uh, biggest pleasures in life, uh, but also because one of the biggest issues uh, in my uh, humble experience with GDPR is that you will always seem to have someone stand up and say, uh, wait, 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 we cannot do that, we cannot collect personal data because of GDPR. And so to say, uh, the biggest issue, in my opinion, uh, with GDPR is not GDPR itself, uh, usually, but the most common misconceptions and uh, misunderstandings uh, around GDPR. The most common uh, misconception, in my opinion, is that uh, you may think that GDPR is uh, a general prohibition on the collection and use of personal data. It is not. It is not, actually, and even if you look at the title of uh, GDPR, 
you will see that it is not only about protection of personal data, but also that the free flow, the free movement of personal data. So clearly, it is a regulation that is about uh, setting up a level playing field <coughs> for uh, companies and public bodies around the European Union to process personal data uh, in order to well create innovative products and services and policies. And you, you understand that the EU legislator uh, had this in mind when uh, adopting GDPR. Now, another point that I would like to raise uh, before jumping into the core of the subject, uh, it is more of a theoretical issue, but uh, it is to say that GDPR is clearly a one-fits-all regulation. Uh, this means that uh, basically if you look at GDPR and you look for information about uh, shared mobility, micro-mobility, you will not find anything. You will not find anything specific to that topic. Uh, it is because GDPR is uh, thought, uh, it is construed as a regulation which may apply to, well, basically everything uh, actual in future, like uh, from health data to uh, digital marketing and so on. So what we lawyers do when we encounter a new topic and we have to uh, think uh, in GDPR perspective, we often look at uh, case law and uh, doctrine from supervisory authorities, EU authorities. Uh, and the issue here is that, especially in France, you have very little to no uh, doctrine and uh, case law and guidance on uh, the sheer topic of micro-mobility, shared mobility. Uh, <coughs> so what you have to do, well, is to be creative. And this is part of the, the good pleasure I have to work with Yanova on this issue, is that you have to be creative about the way you uh, set yourself and your service in compliance with GDPR. Now, what I will try to do here is not to give you an extended course on GDPR because we don't have the time and I understand this is not the purpose. So I will basically explain the broad picture of uh, what you can do with micro mobility data, and specifically the MBS data, uh, in compliance with GDPR. Yes. And the first question uh, you must ask yourself when you uh, encounter uh, mobility data is basically, uh, is micro-mobility data personal data as per GDPR? Um, this question, uh, it points at another question, which is more fundamental, what is personal data? If we look at the definition of personal data in GDPR, as you can see on the slide, uh, the main criterion for the definition is uh, well, about identify, identifiability of uh, the natural person. And so, what I call the reasonable re-identification test is basically a test to determine if you're dealing with personal data or not. Uh, <coughs> this is the first and foremost question because basically if, you, uh, if your conclusion uh, after that test is that you are not dealing with, your, not dealing with personal data at all, uh, well, we can just go outside and grab a drink and end this already because you will not have GDPR uh, applying to your situation. So this test, what I call the reasonable re-identification test, is uh, provided by GDPR itself. It is to say that uh, personal data is data that you can uh, start from and using means that are reasonably likely to be used you can, from the data, uh, identify, re-identify uh, the, uh, the natural person, the individual. Now, the big question is, what uh, does it mean, uh, means reasonably likely to be used? Well, uh, I think there is an interesting analogy to raise here. It uh, starts from the 2016 case law from the European Court of Justice, that is uh, Breyer, the Breyer case. Uh, which was about the IP address. Uh, in this case, the European Court of Justice uh, was asked, basically, what is personal data? Is the IP address of personal data? Um, and it said that what one should understand uh, by means reasonably likely to be used, well, first, it encompasses both legal 
lawful and unlawful means, because as we will see just after, uh, uh, one crucial point of GDPR is to protect the person against the data breach. So basically, unlawful access to personal data. And also, you can have personal data uh, that is determined by combination with other data sets. Um, to put it very simply, uh, there are two categories of personal data. You have direct identifiers, like a name or an email address, clearly this is personal data, and you have indirect personal data. Uh, indirect personal data is personal data that is not in itself identifying, but if you combine it with other sources, you end up uh, re-identifying the individual. And I think this helps us uh, have a typology of micromobility data. If we go back to the subject of uh, micromobility data, clearly uh, it will depend on what you include in the micromobility data sets. If you have in your data set uh, a user direct identifier, such as the user email address, clearly you have personal data. There is no doubt about that. If you only have geolocation data without anything else, well, it's a bit more complicated uh, because uh, there have been much literature about uh, whether you could identify uh, individuals based on geolocation data alone. And it is, we can just go on the next slide. I will very briefly mention this, but this is a, a, this is a piece of research that has been quoted a lot by um, supervisory authorities, and especially in France, uh, the French authorities of NIL. Uh, this was a, a piece of research uh, based on data from uh, New York taxes that was uh, provided as, well, quite anonymous data, because it was geolocation data alone. And some people found that uh, by uh, combining geolocation data uh, in a sufficient manner, let's say, you could end up re-identifying some people, and especially uh, uh, famous people like uh, famous actor, uh, Bradley Cooper, I always forget his name. Um, so even if you only have geolocation data, you might have personal data. And in the MDS case, which is interesting for us, if we go back to the previous uh, slide, if it's possible, um, if we have MDS data, uh, which I understand to be well, roughly said, uh, geolocation data put with vehicle ID. Uh, you have the vehicle ID. The vehicle ID in itself, clearly it is not a direct identifier because if you know the vehicle ID, you don't know, especially with a shared vehicle, you don't know the name of the person behind. But someone, somewhere, has the name, has the possibility to link the vehicle ID with the user ID. This is, well, basically the mobility operator itself. And so, uh, if we look at the case law uh, from the European Court of Justice and the, the doctrine of EU authorities, we, we have, which have a very broad understanding of the notion of personal data, uh, I will argue as a first conclusion that it is safer to think that you are dealing with personal data when you are dealing with MDS data. But, as I mentioned before, this does not result in uh, the processing of MDS data being unlawful at all. It is just to say that GDPR will apply and you will perfectly be able, this is at least the conclusion to which uh, I've come, that you are totally able to process MDS data in a uh, GDPR compliant fashion. How to do this, we will look at just now. Um, Again, I will not try and explain everything which is in GDPR and, and, and all GDPR obligations. Uh, maybe a, a first uh, important uh, lesson to, to, to take out of this is that GDPR, especially in the case that uh, we were presenting just before, is, well, about teamwork. Uh, it is about team working. Uh, and as in every kind of teamwork, what you have to know is what is everyone's role and responsibilities. And so if you have a look at this, uh, at this diagram, that, was, uh, that is roughly a, a simplified version of the diagram we saw before about how Vianova uh, service is functioning. Um, 
the question is how to allocate responsibilities under GDPR. Uh, what we see there is that you have different people, you have the users who are qualified as uh, data subjects, uh, mobility operator who collects uh, personal data in a directly identifiable way, because as I said before, mobility operator has uh, its user identifiers. Um, and uh, using a service like Vianovaz, um, a city for purposes that are uh, possibly uh, very diverse and, and, and self-defined, uh, a city uh, collects uh, MGS data, MGS data that is again geolocation data with uh, uh, vehicle IDs, so indirectly identifying data, uh, and the platform uh, process the data to, uh, and the, outco the outcome is uh, a mobility insights, so something that does not have uh, necessarily the, uh, the vehicle ID. All of this you can uh, analyze in a GDPR perspective by saying that the city is a data controller. A data controller is the person or the entity or the, the public body who uh, determines the uh, purposes and means of the processing of personal data. So the city, because it defines its own uh, purposes for using MGS data, is called the data controller. It goes with certain obligations uh, uh, that are uh, quite well defined in GDPR. And one of these is when you uh, engage what we call a data processor, so basically a technical service provider that will process personal data for you, is to have a DPA, a data processing agreement, uh, which is a, a series of obligations that you put on your processor to ensure that you will process personal data in a compliant manner. This uh, Ganova has, and this is something that is very uh, crucial for organizing uh, processing of personal data when you uh, commission that processing to a third party platform. I will not discuss the license agreement because uh, Thibault has already uh, given extended views on that. And I will just uh, try to explain uh, now a general uh, framework for understanding how GDPR compliance works. Uh, I will argue that it is mostly about uh, utility and risks. It is a utility and risk-based approach. Uh, why utility? Because uh, if you look at GDPR and how to put yourself in compliance, you will see that everything is about the purpose, the, the why, uh, the reason for uh, processing personal data. From that why, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can determine uh, uh, what personal data you can collect. This is the principle of data limitation. You can determine uh, your retention period. This is the principle of storage limitation. And you can determine also uh, your security and confidentiality measures. You can also determine your legal basis, which is basically the justification why you are authorized under GDPR to collect a personal data. And I will end by focusing on this, these two issues uh, by saying that uh, the risk-based approach to security uh, is very well defined by authorities in the EU. Uh, and it is to say that uh, you have a flexible application of GDPR. And you have especially a flexible application uh, based on the degree of identification, possibility of identification based on the data you collect and process. So as we mentioned before, MGS data has a very low degree of re-identification because you don't have uh, at end uh, the user identifiers. So, you can uh, uh, justify a flexible application of GDPR and of uh, security measures. And to uh, give a final word on that, if we switch to the legal basis topic, uh, it is to say that uh, European cities, uh, European cities have plenty of reasons for collecting and processing personal data. Uh, maybe we can discuss that just after in the Q and A. But uh, the, the, the these, those reasons we fall under public services with legal obligation and so on. Okay, I think we have to go quick. To yeah, yeah. so uh, I will uh, briefly uh, conclude uh, on this and, uh, and uh, present how uh, we at Genova uh, protect confidentiality, integrity, and uh, availability of uh, sensitive data. So, 
First, uh, all our mobility data is uh, anonymized. Uh, secondly, we use various segregation techniques. Um, all our features are designed with a strict privacy principle in mind. Uh, there is a strict access control to all our data. And finally, we uh, do not resell uh, any uh, data. Um, so uh, we have come to the conclusion of, uh, of uh, this webinar, and uh, I think uh, uh, we, uh, we can uh, point out a few uh, key takeaways. Uh, so what we saw is that, uh, of course, not all cities uh, are alike, uh, but their problems uh, seem to be uh, universal. Uh, so first, uh, cities uh, running tender this year uh, should make sure uh, to include data sharing agreements, requirements. Um, then uh, we believe that cities should engage into proactive collaboration with uh, operators. Uh, and we have seen uh, that uh, there are uh, tools such as uh, data format, MDS, and uh, third party systems available uh, for, for that. Um, then we uh, saw uh, that uh, it's important uh, for cities to act now, even if everything is not perfect, uh, since uh, it can be a slow process. So uh, cities uh, start acting now. And finally, uh, policy making is an iterative uh, process uh, that should be uh, data driven. Thank you. We'll take the questions now. Uh, so, a couple of questions. We'll go back to Jenny. Chatty. Um, so everyone can ask the questions now. Um, I think there was one from uh, Giles, um, <clears throat> Giles Bailey. Uh, uh, you can sure. chat again. Sure. Let's go. Let's go with that. See, that's fine. Um, not sure how many questions you have, but it may be useful to explain how we help small operators to develop the MDS feed. Um, that's true. Actually, one of the things that we've done with the cities we work with, uh, and actually, I think Russell is, is a very good example because they had a lot of small operators um, uh, and agreed that for small operators, it's generally a bit more difficult for them because they have less resources to, to develop the MDS API. Um, so what we do is that we've been actually really working actively with them in terms of the specifications and actually verifying um, uh, the quality of the data and the, uh, the, the accuracy of the API that they set up. Uh, so this has been work that we have been doing ourselves in a collaborative way with the small operators. Uh, also, if times allow, what are we looking for uh, in a city test case uh, for a delivery management pilot? What are we looking for? In a city test pilot for delivery management pilot, um, <clears throat> I think generally, like we see, the right time frame for pilots uh, is around twelve months, uh, in order to basically making sure that we can. Uh, uh, we see generally it's one month at the beginning to um, set up the pilot, uh, the objective, the different use cases, uh, doing setting up the license agreements with the operators, uh, um, communicating with the operators about the project. Um, and then having a clear planning uh, towards uh, the, the 12 months, basically, on uh, what are the, the policies that we want to set up, uh, what are the mobility insights that the city is interested in, um, providing like uh, a monthly report uh, to the city executive so uh, they can uh, basically circulate that report uh, and make sure that um, uh, mobility insights are being shared like across the, uh, uh, across the, are we good? I think it's fine as long as we see the question now. Yeah, and because we can't, um, I can't see the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Hello and thank you for the presentation. Uh, Uber will not be required to share data in the newly voted LUM. Uh, or will they be prevented from getting access to data with option? Yes. 
any. Um, okay, so the question here is Uber will not be required to share data in a newly voted loan. Um, is that a question or a fact? Yeah. Uh, uh, I would sort of disagree with that, but I, I think it doesn't really, no, to some extent. To well, I think, I think it's a fact as it's presented, but that's um, actually, it depends. It depends it's, uh, if it's um, on, on the context of the, the locality. And uh, if the, for example, if a city uh, makes a, a new tender to actually regulate the operators and under that tender, the, the city mandates the force, forces the operators to, to actually publish the data in open data, then, then it would be oblig obligated. But yeah, you're right that under the law, the, the new uh, mobility law yeah. in France, uh, private operators are not Obligated to yeah, to but it to but it gives the responsibility of uh, to the a uh, to the uh, AOM, uh, Actually, yeah. which basically AOM can enforce uh, the the right. and just um, like GTFS. Yeah, so how will be prevented from getting access to data without sharing this? Um, I mean, from our service, uh, from our service, I'm talking about our services, Bionova, uh, operators basically receive uh, policy data uh, from the city and they can see their own data on the dashboard. However, they cannot see, of course, the data of the competitors. Um, so it's clearly defined in terms of the, uh, the access rules or so of, of, each, uh, of each users. And if Uber basically is providing the data to the platform or even not providing the data to the platform, in any case, if they don't provide the, the data to the platform, uh, they will only access to the, to the, only access to the policy uh, information, uh, but not their own data on the dashboard. Having access to their own data on the dashboard, all the APIs allow them to make sure that it basically uh, own, uh, to make sure that uh, we are aligned with what uh, uh, they uh, think they, they should have in terms of representations, which is generally like uh, most of the time the case. Um, how do you go about authenticating the data received from operators? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what it means, but uh, basically from the operators themselves, um, obviously like we have a different, uh, and I think I could go back to Guillaume there, but I think we do have um, a different end access points uh, to APIs of the different operators. So we obviously know uh, which data is coming from who. Uh, and as a service in terms of Vianova, and again, this is, this is, this is a, 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 a more of a, of a, of a company a thing, uh, we do have metadata for everything that we basically uh, um, um, request from the uh, mobility operator. So we know exactly like what we've been uh, what we've been loading and, and and to which data correspond to who. Uh, and within the MDS, we do, we do also have the provider ID. Uh, our data are made open to us. Um, I think there's a question from Ellen from Stockholm. Uh, thanks for joining, Ellen. Um, any European city that was able to establish this in-house without third-party solution? Um, the, answer, the, the quick answer is no, but I think Lisbon uh, has tried, uh, and I think successfully, uh, to integrate um, uh, the data using uh, not MDS, but another or uh, an MDS-like format uh, within Lisbon. Uh, so I think uh, Lisbon is a good example of a city that uh, manage, uh, not sure by themselves or with a consulting agency uh, with them, uh, to integrate uh, a data format which I think was similar to MDS, but not MDS. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, that, the, the data feed. Uh, otherwise, like I don't have other examples. Uh, Paris maybe can be cited as a city who actually at the moment wants to regulate the, the space and they have a, a ten, kind of tender uh, ongoing and uh, they are not going to use MDS and the, actually the, the specification of the data they ask to form operators uh, as part of the tender is not specified in the tender, yeah. which is a, a, a big problem because yeah. uh, how can they actually know what the operator will share will open, uh, one can hope they will uh, put it in the contract uh, at a later date, but at the moment it's uh, kind of a disappointment, I think, because uh, we would hope that uh, the data is being 
you okay. can ask, ask you a lot yeah. of data from the operators. But, but I think from Paris' perspective, I'm not, uh, I know that before the tender, they were not using MDS, but I think now they're asking themselves a question. I yeah, think no, they're not too sure what to use. They, they actually wrote a small, uh, small specification called CBU. Yeah. Um, and they have probably spent some time to, 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 to decide what they did. But uh, yeah, we don't actually know uh, when, the end, uh, when the tender will end. We don't know what they will decide to do. But, uh, Audric is asking how data are made open to us from the operator to open data provider. Uh, so, as I said before, you have the national access, access point for France, which is transport.data.gov.fr. Uh, in that website, you can actually see open data from, uh, on GBFS format and GTFS format. Obviously, there is a lot of GTFS data set open, and you can uh, use it, as I said before, and make a lot of uh, things to with it, like the, the Paris dashboard for Belib. The lib, uh, the data is uh, open and you can use it. It depends, obviously, on the reg regulation. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a link to the previous question that Uber is not uh, forced to publish its uh, data in open, but still some services uh, make use of it, like CityMapper, the most famous example, which uh, shows data from a lot of operators, but it's a bit it's storated from the it's storated from the operators because it, the data is not open, but they have kind of an agreement. Mm -hmm. But at a later date, the operator can say, yeah. "I don't allow CityMapper to use my yeah. data," yeah. and they will uh, be uh, yeah. it will be legal to do so. The problem yeah. is that you will have some actors like Google, which we should show in its application, like Google Maps, which is the most famous one, uh, only uh, operators from its own. Yeah, yeah, it's I mean, the, the question about line, 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 line because the Google Ventures invest. It's not an upper, it's not a, like a scenario in the science fiction uh, scenario. It's actually the reality now. If you go to Google Maps, only line operator, uh, only line data is used by Google, and it's a problem of uh, you know uh, competition. And so, uh, we know that uh, the European Union will regulate that, but it's not. Okay. So I'm just conscious of time, so yeah. for everyone. Um, I think the next questions were to, to just answer this one, like how data made available for open data. I think it really depends on the city policy. Uh, then it's a question on, on, on uh, obviously, like from MDS. I think it's important to MDS. Within MDS, you do have GDBFS. Uh, so you can actually extract GDBFS, which are open data compliant. Uh, so in a way, um, within the data, data license agreement, we can ask, uh, depending on what the city policy is, uh, GBFS like uh, data that are not, not in, identifiable, uh, that are being shown in an aggregate, in an aggregated, grid, aggregated way or not, to be shown basically uh, on, 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 on open data. Susan Hodley asking, how does MDS compare with other European mobility data such as Siri, which is used for real time public transport data? Um, I think for I'm not sure if you want to know Siri this. is more related to GTFS, where it's yeah. more about transit yes. and uh, buses, metro. Uh, there is no, um, there is also NetEx, which is the, the norm, European norm uh, compared to GTFS. Uh, it could be extended um, to to prov to show data from uh, free floating and stuff like that. But in my opinion, it will take a long time if, if GPFS and DS. Uh, uh, actually, we, there are a lot of movement from that uh, format, and there are a lot of changes uh, over time. I think uh, other format like NetEx and Siri will take uh, more time, even yeah. more time to, to actually, uh, I would say, reflect the reality of the landscape. And I think, I mean, the question is also that uh, obviously, like the to which extent also public transporter can be as reactive as private transporter. And making sure that they can also fit to the norm. Well, uh, when you look at the history of GTFS versus like NetEx, GTFS has success because it, it starts from the yes. needs of the consumers, the yeah. applications, and want to you know calculate an itinerary, a route, and that's why GTFS is successful, and that's mm -hmm. why I think GBFS and NDS will be successful. But actually, I think what is just interesting to note here is that NDS was really done for the management of the public space. Uh, management uh, public space. So it was mostly done for floating mobility. 
So mobility that don't have a fixed route, whereas normally uh, public transport has a fixed route, unless it's actually autonomous shuttles, and then this will actually, uh, for public transport, maybe at some point comes in the MDS. If we don't work with permits or tenders, why should the operators provide on a voluntary basis that that help us to penalize them? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Um, so far, in all the cities we worked with, we didn't really sort of penalize or issue tickets or anything like that. I think it was mostly used actually as a self-policing platform uh, for both the cities and mostly actually the operators. So they know basically uh, from the evaluation of how compliant they are and why they're not being compliant. Um, but I think it's a good question uh, that uh, to some extent, exactly, if it's done on a voluntary basis data, um, obviously, like if you have the stick on one hand, uh, it might be difficult basically to tell them, okay, give me the data for me to potentially uh, hit you in a way. So, um, so yeah, you know, we believe that it should be part of the permit to tender. Um, uh, and I think it sort of depends on the operator. It's a small operator, like uh, not Lime, because Lime has uh, an agreement with Google, so they are fine with their data only accessible in Google Maps, and Google wants that. But as an operator, the data producer, you want your data and uh, you want to, to reach as many users as possible. So you want to be on the, the apps like CityMapper, Google Maps, other, other application, website. So you but, should make yeah. your data as a, with a license that makes it clear that you, you can... But use. this is not MDS, I'm what you're talking about. This yeah, is I'm, I, I'm talking yeah. about GBFS. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even from a legal point of view, from the, the point of view uh, of the city, it's always better to have this in an agreement. A, a permit or tender is a kind of agreement, it's a public agreement, uh, because a voluntary basis is basically no commitment at all from a legal point of view. So if you want to make sure that the provision of data will continue over time, and you can also address in the permit or tenders topics such as data quality, data security, and so on. Yes, in theory, I agree that it is always better to have it in the permit or tender. Uh, Albert Renault is asking the following question. Uh, thank you guys for your presentation. A lot of examples you showed apply to micromobility. What is your view on availability on data for other modalities such as public transport, private bikes, and cars? To answer it quickly, as yes. Uh, a lot of the examples that we've shown today are uh, applying to micromobility. However, we actively know discussing with some cities to apply it uh, to car sharing and also delivery services, uh, just as an example. Also, I think what you're mentioning here is mostly like, how do we come about uh, the availability of data for public transport? Uh, so I think this is GDFS, but generally GD, uh, open public transport is most of the time um, available. Uh, online on open data yeah, and private us. bikes and cars. Um, again, here, so, and I'm not going to give too many details on that. Uh, I've done a few trips in Germany lately, uh, and these few trips actually were designed to make sure that we could actually get uh, floating car data, uh, which are basically available from uh, auto manufacturers, which basically can help. Also, like having traffic information directly from uh, uh, the connected car data system, uh, and most actually in this case was uh, uh, delivery uh, and trucks uh, um, uh, floating car data, so GPS location. So it is possible; it's just on the way. Um, however, someone is to start with something, and so far, my probability was generally uh, with also delivery and uh, urban logistics, one of the biggest issues we've seen in the city. So Suzanne is asking the following questions. How can cities find their way? How can cities find their way around all these standards? Siri and NetEx are becoming the de facto standards under EU legislation. MTIS delegated regulation or ITS directive. Are the MDS and European data standard communities actually talking to each other? Yeah, that's a good question. A good question. Uh, yeah. Maybe to point yeah, um, I think, uh, I mean, I was discussing with uh, Helsinki and actually the guys from uh, uh, ITS Europe, and uh, we discussed the possibility of actually having a governance in Europe uh, around MDS. Um, whether it is a shared governance with the US or is it completely different uh, 
I think the MDS in itself, the format itself, is, is very powerful. And I think it would be very, very interesting for, for Europe. Uh, we don't have equivalent formats at the moment, uh, let's say like European format, even if uh, we see the M MDS is seen as an international format, not an American standard. Um, however, I think it does make sense to have contribution from Europe, uh, to have a governance from Europe, because we might have different, um, we might just, we might have different regulations such as GDPR. Uh, which basically um, would probably add uh, some layers of MDS in terms of also all the, uh, you know, something, an example, like commit when, when people do like new submissions to MDS, which basically are called commit committed. So when there is a, we commit basically a new, a new part, a new, a new addition to the uh, MDS, uh, could be privacy reviews under European GDPR could be, could be interesting. Yeah. So GTFS and GBFS are two specifications that are governed by Mobility Data, which is a private uh, and independent uh, organism and organization. And uh, it's uh, like you say, you can propose a new modification, and uh, the, the specifications are more agile, and that's why they are successful because they move uh, not as fast as the landscape, but they, they try to keep up. The text is published by uh, the U European Commission, and it's a very complex. Uh, norm. Norm is the best way to actually reflect the realities. It's a big specification and um, actually almost no one is using it because it's too complicated to actually be compliant to this norm at the moment. And uh, at the moment, it's not uh, mandatory to use this norm, so no nobody is using it. When it will be mandatory, maybe one day. Uh, Actually, authorities will have to invest a lot of money to have actually be their data to be compliant because it's GTFS plus a lot of other data, which they probably have on in their database it's about the station, uh, train station, how how we can I uh, go as a to, to access the station and stuff like that, the uh, intermodality stuff like that. It's uh, very complex and. Um, that it's not becoming a standard. The standard, de facto standard, is how the, the, the popularity of the, of the specification and GTFS is winning uh, by a lot. And GPFS uh, also has no equivalent in NetEx. Maybe it will evolve. I know for a fact that the European Commission is talking with mobility data. Uh, I think they are both, uh, they can both benefit to, to, to talk and uh, the NetEx can move forward more quickly than it has before. But uh, I would recommend the city to just um, uh, ask themselves what they need. And what they need probably is that the user can uh, have a good service. But that's the point that we made uh, at the beginning. If they want users to find the, the buses, or buses, or metros, or bikes, they want the data to be accessible in the, the as many services as possible, as many applications, as many you know uh, screens as possible. So yeah, that's what I would ask. So in the end, for now, is G GTFS, GBFS, and MDS to regulate, and uh, GBFS and GTFS as open data. That's that's what I would recommend for for cities, but they have to make it a contract to for private operators to follow that contract. I think that's pretty much it. We don't get any more questions. Do we have any questions? Should we ask each other some questions? Or mm -hmm. we could? Uh, any questions in the back? No. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's a good wrap up. Um, thank you everyone for joining. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, see you again in the uh, next uh, webinar. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.